Hello, uh, my name is uh, Teresa Wolstead, and this, we're looking at a basic overview of regulatory theory. By no means this is an all-inclusive discussion of all the treaties that, that you need to navigate as a Native artist. Alaska has a very diverse regulatory mosaic. So we have what is called dual management in the state of Alaska, where we do actually have distinct regulations for federal and state land, but even within the state itself, we have a variety of different land managers. So not only do we have the National Park Service, U.S. Bureau of Land Management, Forest Service, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. We also have Alaska State Parks, Alaska Division of Forestry, and the Alaska Department of Fish and Game go in and manage different things and different regions and zones. So this is example right here of a map, and you can see that when you're going through the state of Alaska, there are very distinct zones with different policies on harvest for the state of Alaska for raw materials, both in terms of fish and wildlife, but also botanicals as well. So we're talking ryegrass, cedar bark, spruce roots, and even found objects and such, such as uh, antler that drop naturally. So there's a variety of different regulations. And before you go out and harvest, it's always important to look at the locations and then also land managers. So first off, let's talk a little bit about federal ownership. So the National Park Service and Fish and Wildlife Service, they manage about 120 million acres across the state of Alaska. Now their main purpose of managing this is actually for resource protection and fish and wildlife conservation. So that's part of their main mission. Now, each individual park, each individual wilderness area does have its own management plan. But in general, when we're looking at US Fish and Wildlife Service and National Park, it's more of protection and conservation. This is a little more distinct as compared to the US Forest Service and Borough of Land Management. They uh, manage about 97.7 million acres, and that's actually more for economics. So we're talking timber production, fish and wildlife recreation, water and mining. So they have very distinct manuals and such talking about harvest, but also more of commercial ventures as well. A very distinct departure as compared to resource protection and conservation. They're more focused on natural resource utilization in a wise and concise manner. Now the remaining federal land is unique in the state of Alaska where we do actually have diverse landscapes and large amount of land that is actually managed for military reservations, national petroleum reserves, and even the US Post Service lands. So we do have a variety of different land managers and they do have distinct management guidelines for their land use. Now the state of Alaska does have overlapping resources and management across the state of Alaska. This is in turn a lot again when we talk about different management of species such as grouse and ptarmigan that are not migratory birds and even as caribou as they migrate across uh, federal, federal and state lands. In general, fish and game, they're managing fish and wildlife and aquatic plant resources. And they're focused on managing those resources on the sustainable yield principle. They also work with the Alaska, to, they also work with uh, the Board of Game and the Board of Fish. They're the ones that are actually looking at allocating the amount of resources to be harvested at a particular area. So they're allocations. And they're always open online. You can actually go and look at the regulations and they're the ones that put out the booklets and such about harvest manuals. But they're in general managing for a wide range of public uses and for the general public as Alaskans as whole. Now the Alaska Department of Natural Resources, they also are very important when we start talking about Alaska Native artwork. Now they're not managing fish and wildlife, but more importantly, they're doing botanical aspects. So the Division of Forestry manages about 2 million acres of dedicated state forests, specifically for multiple use and that sustained yield principle. Now the Division of Mining and Land and Water is the one that's per responsible for preparing that land use plans and the permitting for the harvest of those natural resource materials that are botanical. So if you want to go out and harvest spruce roots or such, you're going to need to go and talk to the Alaska Department of Natural Resources, Division of Mining and Land and Water. They're the ones that you're going to need to go through and get permitting for commercial harvest to make commercial native arts using botanical materials. Now it's unique also where we have the Division of Park and Outdoor Recreation. They also do manage a lot of the state parks for recreational opportunities. Now, the key aspect here is they focus on conservation of natural, cultural, and historical resources for public use. 
So you do have opportunities for personal use. We're going out and actually working and harvesting enough just for traditional cultural activities. So harvesting a little bit of grass, it kind of depends on the amount that you're looking at and the locations and then the management of that particular state park. But do go in and check in with the Division of Park and Outdoor Recreation. A lot of these areas have really good access with trails. And there is opportunity for actually having elders be able to go out in the field and be able to teach and show harvest techniques in an area that's easily and readily accessible. But again, when you're going to be talking more of commercial, a lot of that is going to be going through the division of mining and land and water that's going to be focusing on harvest manual specifically for commercial native arts. So when we're talking about native arts, one of the more interesting things that we need to think about is it's very diverse. There's a lot of materials that can actually be utilized for traditional native arts. This ranges everywhere from traditional fur bears, so foxes and beavers, to even abalone shells. We even do have a mix now of different commercial and uh, natural products that are being mixed in with it as well, from uh, canvas linen to ryegrass. There's a variety of different techniques and styles, but also a variety of different natural materials that are being utilized nowadays for art. And all of these materials have to be classified and categorized. So if you harvest it under personal use, it can only be used for personal use. If you're harvesting it under commercial, you can utilize it for commercial. But again, you need to go through and actually catalog and bin a lot of these materials. And some of the materials that you harvest require yearly reports. So it's always important when you're going through and actually harvesting a lot of these materials to consider what are the reporting requirements, but then also storage and separation. Another example that we're going to be talking to a little bit about is migratory birds and their differences in treaties with the Morton policy. So there's a variety of different things that you need to consider, but also realize that there's a variety of different materials and each one needs to be considered when you're looking at management for treaties and then also even opportunities for actually harvest. So I mentioned species utilized in the artwork. When you're talking about an individual art piece, realize that it is a mosaic of many different regulatory agencies and such that permit that ability to make and create art. So native art itself is a regulatory mosaic. And even a lot of the many traditional materials even carry multiple treaties that actually govern its transportation and use. Um, this example right here is a beautiful piece of Siberian Yupik uh, raincoat, and it was collected from St. Lawrence Island, made about the 1920s. Beautiful thing. It's made out of uh, seal lion intestines, crested auklet scalps, cotton, and fur trim. But as first off I mentioned, it's got marine mammals into it, but it also has migratory bird treaty because we have the crested auklet scalps and such. So when you're going through and looking at this, it's not just one act, the Marine Mammal Protection Act. There's multiple treaties, there's multiple species that need to be categorized when you're utilizing these native artworks. So if you're transporting it or you're going between different areas, it's always important to keep a list of all the individual species that are involved for this particular native art piece. So the first step of navigating all these complicated treaties and all these complicated regulatory managers is to keep a very specific species inventory and catalog. So when you have different native art pieces, you need to make sure that you identify the species used in the creation of any given artwork. Every species also looking at locations where you harvested it. The second step is really to start analyzing the state or federal laws that can be applied to that piece as well. And this also kind of given a lot of information on interstate, intrastate and international commerce. So if you have a beautiful piece of uh, beaded artwork that utilizes uh, moose leather and then sea otter trim, you need to make sure whether or not it's going to be ever shipped outside the state of Alaska or if it's going to be kept within the state because there are some limitations when we start talking about shipping and movement between interstate and extrastate. And that's very important when we start looking at beyond just personal use, even movement between that for your own use can actually require forms and regulations. 
The third step, really, when you finally get the idea of what you want to do with it, whether or not it's going to be moved between states or such, is to really start assessing the licenses, permits, and authorities to be able to actually create the artwork, the use of the artwork, and the transportation of the artwork. So start really kind of thinking about once you actually are planning to make artwork, you need to think about what is your creative intent behind it? What is your creative use behind it? And then whether or not you're gonna be transporting it or even using it for commercial sale. So there's a variety of different things you need to consider for each piece of artwork. And that will also help determine what materials you're able to utilize for the intent of the artwork itself. So talking about big treaties, talking about the big steps when you first start considering native arts, the first one we always talk about is the Lacey's Act, and that's back in 1900. So this prohibits the import, export, or transportation, purchase, or sale of species where it would violate state, federal, or tribal, or foreign law between states and such. So you can't just take something that's illegally harvested in Alaska and then go down to Washington and you get out scot-free. The laws and regulations and violations follow wherever that piece goes. And this kind of helped out a lot more when we start talking about a lot of the problems of the Migratory Bird Treaty Act that first started out when they were trying to solve when it was initiated. And that's basically avoiding people from taking materials illegally and then transporting between states to avoid prosecution. So this is starting to set up that idea of regulating between state regulations transports and then also international. The next one we start talking about is the Endangered Species Act and that happened in 1973. The emphasis here is it's designed to protect critically imperiled species from extinction and help to assist in their recovery. The focus of that is it limits and prohibits importation or export of listed species. So you do have the Endangered Species Act and those listed species can change over time but that actually limits the import and export of these limited species within in-state and ex-state transport. And that goes into a little more of the CITES that we'll discuss later. But the key aspect here is when you start looking at transport, Alaska is unique. We have one Alaska designated port and that actually is Anchorage. And that's the only designated US Fish and Wildlife Service port where, P where native art that actually has species that are gonna be exported or so. So we're talking like things that could be endangered, things that need regulatory permitting. They usually have to go through Anchorage and that's the designated port. Now artists that are going to be flying out of other area hubs such as Fairbanks that does have an international airport, they can get a designated port exception permit prior to shipping, but that does cost extra fees and it does take a little while prior to departure and such and getting all the additional forms. So if you're going to be flying internationally with uh, Native art that actually includes materials that could be considered listed, such as walrus ivory, sea otter fur, or even any things like lynx fur or such that actually is listed under other aspects of endangered species across the, the world, you may need to be able to go through and talk to these permits and get a lot of these CITES export permits. And a lot of it is just calling the Anchorage airport and talking with a designated U.S. Fish and Wildlife inspector and being able to find out what permits you need. I mentioned CITES a little bit. Let's talk a little more in detail of that. So CITES is an international agreement between multiple nations. The idea there is to ensure that international trade in wild species does not threaten all these imperiled species survival. So it's a way to kind of start regulating the export and utilization of native species in those areas where they're endangered and it helps provide protection. The key thing here is there are three levels of protection. It isn't just a, letter, a listing of endangered or threatened. There's three levels of protection that can be listed under there. The first level is the most threatened and that is the international commerce for those endangered species is generally prohibited. So you can't have international commerce at all of these animals or species. The second one is international commercial trade is allowed but controlled. Those are areas where you're going to have species that are similar to others, such as lynx, where you do have Alaska lynx, as an example, is a good steady population. They're healthy and there's a, enough surplus for harvest, but there's also imperiled species of lynx across the world. 
So you, when you're harvesting them in Alaska, you have to certify that it actually came from the state of Alaska before you can ship internationally of that species. And there are forms that you can actually get and be able to go and talk to US Fish and Wildlife Service inspector to be able to certify that. The third one is species subject to regulation with national jurisdictions and such. So those are individual nations that request the individual species to be listed for certain reasons and such, and they'll be able to actually request going in and out of a, their nation itself additional regulations. So example of that is sea otter and then also beluga for Canada. So those are good examples of the state of Alaska and how it impacts with going into Canada. The biggest thing when we're talking with CITES considerations when you're looking at as being a native artist is First off, whether or not the artwork itself is going to be for commercial. Are we actively trying to sell the artwork itself? Or is this a personal uh, exportation? Individuals move. So we do have household goods being moved to another state. Are you shipping the materials as part of your household? Or are you actually going to a conference or a celebration where you need to be able to utilize your traditional regalia? So there's a variety of different ways and reasons for movement of native art materials. And they, they do have distinct needs for regulations. And that also is very important when you start looking at distinct needs of forms, but also how you ship is important. There's a difference between personal hand carried and mail exportation or even shipping itself. Listed species, international restrictions, and even the artwork value itself are considerations when you're looking at actually shipping a lot of this artwork. So the basic thing when you're looking at trying to take native arts across international borders, or for example, the state of Alaska trying to travel through Canada, is you're gonna need the US Fish and Wildlife Service Form 3-177. This is the legal document declaring the materials that are used in the handicrafts. So it certifies that that materials that you're utilized were harvested in an area sustainably within the state of Alaska. So it does allow for those species that are allowed to be shipped across the international borders to be do so, but you have to declare those materials. And that means all the species and such utilized in each individual piece. So when you're looking at individual pieces, it can be everything from whether or not the material that is Chilcat is made from merino wool or mountain goat wool. If it has a sea otter fur on it, does it have any deer toes? A lot of the materials looking and actually listing and inventorying all species utilized both in the piece itself. So when you start looking at uh, species, there are some that are just prohibited. A good example of that is handicrafts that include materials from baleen whale seals and protected migratory birds cannot be exported per se per the US for commercial. So you can't sell handicrafts that actually come from recurry birds internationally and such. And those are examples where there's just a ban. You can't necessarily do so. I talked a little briefly about uh, the CITES Appendix 3, where there are specifics for individual nations. Canada actually has several prohibited species. Those are sea otter and beluga whales. So they prohibit the import and export of items made from those materials. Now, Canada does have walruses listed under three, and they require proof of a purchase from Alaska when you're translating through the nation itself. So again, getting that form that declares the materials utilized in the handicrafts is one of the most important things when you're utilizing these materials. For Alaska, it's also kind of interesting and such because you do have a distinction between travel. Um, if you're traveling through, so you're driving through to Canada, you're gonna need that permit form. If you're on a plane that is going from Anchorage to Washington state and you don't get off the plane somewhere in Canada and such, that is considered still within the US. You're not actually going through a foreign nation. It's just, you have to stay on the plane and it has to be personally carried by the individual on the plane itself. So then it's a personal item itself. And that is another exception specifically to CITES. And again, that's a personal item. It's not something that's being commercially sold. It's just carrying your own personal regalia. And that again, talks a little more about the personal and household effects exemption. So when you start looking at different materials that are being shipped across the US and such, it does waive certain requirements of asserting of CITES permits. The key thing is it has to be for personal use 
and is accompanied with your baggage itself. The artwork can be part of a shipment of household goods. So if you're moving from different state to state within the US, you don't necessarily need that CITES, but again, it can't be commercial. It's just personal household goods. Species that are generally available for this exception is those that are basically under Appendix 2 and 3. Uh, anything that's under Appendix 1 does not fit this exception. You have to go through and do all the declaring and you have to talk to your U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service inspector for details on that. Now, it does not apply to species protected under other migratory, uh, other uh, treaties. So we're talking Endangered Species Act, Wild Bird Conservation Act, Migratory Bird Treaty Act, or the Marine Mammal Protection Act. So there are exceptions to the exception, I guess. <clears throat> but when you're looking at a lot of this, the best thing to do when you're looking at different exceptions to the policies is again, talk to the designated anchorage port where you have exportation and talking to the US Fish and Wildlife Service inspector. They'll be able to provide you access to those forms themselves and also provide a lot of guidance to be able to assist you with moving a lot of these materials across international borders or even when trying to get outside the state of Alaska itself and going to other states in the US. I mentioned it briefly, but one of the biggest things that we're starting to look at right now is migratory birds. So Migratory Bird Treaty Act happened back in 1918. And the main focus on that one was the prohibit of harvest, capture, sale, trade, or even transport of protected migratory bird species without authorization of US Fish and Wildlife Service. Now US Fish and Wildlife Service does actually authorize hunting and such of migratory birds, but they limit a lot of the non-consumptive use of the materials. So the non-edible byproducts. So when you're talking about utilization of non-edible byproducts and such, a lot of people think about this as feathers, web feet, a lot of the down and even the skin of birds and even like the tufts of the auklets and such. They've been utilized traditionally for many different native arts, everything from dance fans to this beautiful Yupik dance hat that was created in about 1910. And that's actually made from loose uh, loon skins and such, and even a little bit of seal skin. So they're beautiful materials that are utilized, but when we're talking at migratory bird, there is an overarching ban on the commercial sale of native art materials that have the use of inedible byproducts. This recently changed with the Morton policy. This is very specific to only a key few species, but it allows Alaska native artists to harvest, sell, and resell authentic native handicrafts that contain specific migratory bird species if they are harvested during the spring subsistence harvest. So again, this is talking about rural residents being able to harvest it during a subsistence harvest, which is usually in the spring. This does not include anything that is harvested during the normal sport, which is in the fall. Again, very particular to rural residents, subsistence harvest. There are about 27 migratory birds that are actually on this list. Um, a few of them include tundra swans, calmer eider, common loon, and even the auklets. It's very important to look at those species lists because it is subject to change. So definitely talk with uh, individuals of US Fish and Wildlife Service about reviewing that list. But the key thing here is once you actually do get the materials and you're looking at actually making a native art that is gonna be commercially sold, you also need a form for that. So each sold item that is made utilizing one of those 27 migratory bird species is gonna to have to be accompanied by a certification. And you can get that from US Fish and Wildlife Service, but it has to be signed by the artist or accompanied by a state of Alaska silver hand insignia. So following who the artist is and providing details on the species utilized. Again, you can talk to a lot of the US Fish and Wildlife uh, inspectors and they'll be able to give you information on the species utilized for those commercial arts. But it has to be very specific to a rural resident harvesting during subsistence. Now we do have the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act. So this act is very specific where it 
prohibits the take, possession, sale, transport, harassment of bald and golden eagles, or even utilization of their parts. So that does include feathers that you find along the beach. You can't take or possess these feathers. You can't sell them, transport them, or anything along those lines. And that's very clear. But as you can probably imagine, there's still a use of a bald eagle or even golden eagle parts for traditional cultural acts and practices for natives across the US. The way that US Fish and Wildlife Service allows for that is actually they have what is called the National Eagle Repository. So what native individuals do is they'll actually request from the bank to be issued feathers and such from this area to certify that they were actually provided to them and they were pretty much died naturally. So the National Eagle Repository serves as a basic location for the receipt, processing, storage, and distribution of those eagle parts to only members of federally recognized tribes. And this was actually kind of interesting on a side note where my father was a wildlife, fish and wildlife officer. He actually had collected quite a few eagles around the state of Alaska that had died naturally and would ship them down to this bank. And it's very important to note that Alaska does provide a lot of these eagle feathers, a lot of these eagle parts, or even whole carcasses to the bank itself. And it's open to anybody in the US that is part of a federally recognized tribe. There's a process and such to be able to request them, but you can actually apply. And many of the feathers coming into this bank are actually from Alaska. So we do contribute quite a bit to this. So when you are actually a native artist requesting eagle parts, you have to be at least 18 years old or older. You complete the application and order form. If you're reapplying, you have to again do another reorder form itself. You have to be a member of a federally recognized enrolled Native American tribe or Alaska Native. And the requests are generally filled on a first come first serve basis on the date of the application. You can uh, request everything from the 10 eagle feathers, including a few tail feathers. You can request eagle claws, um, eagle down, or even the whole carcass or wings and such. So you can be very specific or you can request general feathers and such in that area based on the requirements for the ceremony that you're requesting them for. A good example of that is using traditional eagle down for actually dances. Um, we do have quite a few celebrations in Southeast Alaska. And traditionally, you would actually use eagle down for the dances itself with the frontlets. And that is one example for traditional ceremonies. So you can actually be able to utilize these eagle feathers, but there is a process. You can't just go to the, the beach down here in Homer or anything along those lines and pick up an eagle feather that you find. You have to go through the U.S. National Eagle Repository that is actually managed by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And then they'll give you a, a form and a receipt based on the utilization of those parts that you're given. So Marine Mammal Protection Act. <laughs> this happened in 1972 and it established a memorandum on the take and import of marine mammals, including their parts and even products itself. The key here is there are three federal agencies that are kind of responsible for Marine Mammal Protection Act. So NOAA Fisheries is responsible for whales, dolphin, porpoises, seals, and sea lions. In contrast, you have U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that manage walruses, sea otters, and polar bears. Then you also have the Marine Mammal Commission that is an independent science-based oversight for the federal policies and actions that are impacted on the marine mammal. So when you're looking a little bit about getting permits and such, usually it's either NOAA or U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. But if you're looking at more of like what's going on at the policies and you need to review a lot of it, I'd recommend checking out the Marine Mammal Commission itself. And they do a lot of details on the actual harvest itself. The key here is the Marine Mammal Protection Act allows for co-management. So both NOAA and U.S. Fish and Wildlife establish agreements of Alaska Native organizations. Those agreements involve the co-management process, harvest monitoring, research, data collection, and population analysis. So a good example of that is actually the Alaska Eskimo Whaling Commission that manages the bowhead whale subsistence hunt locally through a cooperative agreement. 
So for each individual species in different areas, it's always important to start looking for these different co-management processes or even the commissions themselves. Those commissions can actually start developing a lot of the management and harvest strategies that artists need to be able to follow. So when we're talking about who the artist is and who can actually harvest, the key here is there is a native exception. So any Indian, Aleut, or Eskimo who resides in Alaska and dwells on the North Pacific coast or the Arctic Ocean may take a marine mammal without permit per se. And that's for the Marine Mammal Protection Act. The take, however, has to be for subsistence purposes, for the purposes of creating and selling authentic Alaska native articles of handicraft and clothing, and cannot be accomplished in a wasteful manner. So it has to be sustainable. The definition of who Alaska Native, again, is defined, but we're talking about the Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act. So you have to be one fourth degree of blood or more of Alaskan Indian to be that US citizen to be able to actually fit for that native exception. So it's very clear they do have the blood quantum specifically to the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Now, the key here is you're able to actually utilize the marine mammal for harvest of subsistence foods, but also utilization of the inedible byproducts for the creation of authentic native articles of handicrafts. So what are they? Well, first off, when you start looking at them, they have to be made by Indian, Aleut, or Eskimo. And again, I'm using the terms as specific to the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Those are the words they use as Indian, Aleut, and Eskimo. Um, they have to be composed wholly or in some significant respect of natural materials. So when you're actually utilizing the marine mammals, they need to be significantly made from natural materials themselves. They also have to be significantly, moder significantly modified or altered from their natural form. This can be a, pro a product that has been decorated, fashioned in traditional native styles but you really can't use mass copying devices. So everything has to be done by hand. So hand stitching and such is usually allowed. There is some exceptions for, for tanneries for marine mammals where you can use heavy duty machines for actually doing the tanning process and the stitching. But in general, most of this stuff has to be done by hand. So techniques are usually accepted including weaving, carving, stitching, lacing, sewing, beading, drawing, or even painting. So this, again, does allow for carving and painting for scrimshaw, and it does allow some modern implementations and such, such as drills for being able to carve ivory. But again, the main limitation is no large mass production industry can actually exist. It has to be done individually by the individual artist. That, again, is Indian, Aleut, or Eskimo. Now, I mentioned a little bit with marine mammal exceptions for tanneries. So when we're looking at tanneries, you can actually be able to send your marine mammal fur and such to be able to be commercially tanned. Now, the key here is the marine mammal prohibits the transfer of marine mammals unless to Alaska natives. So when you are looking at actually transferring the marine mammals in its raw form, it has to be done to another Alaska native. Now, they can work at these tanneries, so then this starts allowing for the process. So Alaska Native can transfer through a registered agent directly to a registered tannery. So you're directly going from an individual that is native and qualified to a registered permitted tannery. And that can be specific only for the processing of marine mammals for the creation of authentic Alaska Native handicrafts, articles, or clothing. So when you're looking at actually registration, I mentioned previously that there is a distinction between the two different managers. So if it's gonna be processing polar bear hides, walruses, or sea otters, the application that's gonna be a tannery has to apply for US Fish and Wildlife Service director itself. If you're looking at doing seals, whales, sea lions, applications usually is going for the National Marine Fisheries director itself. A lot of this is going back to the OLE form, that's 3-20-44. And the application requires a description of the procedures for receiving, storing, processing, and even shipping the materials, and even a bookkeeping system for all marine mammals that are going to be received. So there's a lot of requirement in making sure that, again, the transfer is going to be between Alaska Native to Alaska Native, 
and it's going to be kept along those lines for processing. This is just an example. This is a registered agency tannery biannual inventory report. So if you're going to be a tannery that works with marine mammals, there's a lot of bookkeeping that's going to be involved and it's a lot of detail information that needs to be kept and very cleared. I mentioned a little bit about bookkeeping. Something else that's kind of interesting is we start talking a little bit about these regulatories and looking a lot more about the treaties is also harvest manuals. So there's a lot of harvest manuals that go on beyond just overarching treaties and limitations, but actually guide how you can harvest materials in the state of Alaska. This ranges everywhere from the state of Alaska non-timber forest products harvest manual to even uh, the Alaska hunting regulation booklet is put out. So the variety of different managers and agencies have their own one. And it's always important to look at those manual guides. So one of the first things we talk about with Alaska Native Art, of course, is big game and fur bears. So big game, there's brown bears, black bears, caribou, moose, bison, sitka deer, elk, mountain goat, musk oxen, and doll sheep. Those are the big game species in the state of Alaska. Big game trophies are very important when we start talking about the management and being able to actually utilize materials. So they define big game trophies as the amount of a big game animal, including the skin of the head, the entire skin, or lifelike representation of the animal. It's important to note that there's limitations on the sale of big game animals. So if you're going to go and utilize materials from black bear, brown bear, caribou, moose, bison, sitka, you have to make sure that you basically are not utilizing a lifelike representation of the animal and it's significantly modified. Fur bears are distinctly different though. So Alaska has about 19 species that are classified as either fur bearers or actually for animals. And they are subject to the taking with a trapping license. Now these uh, for animals, those include beaver and fox or big game wolf and wolverine. So there is some overlapping with some of the big game animals. Now fur bears classified as fur or big game animals may be taken under either the trapping regulations or a hunting license under hunting regulations. So it depends on how you're gonna go through and actually harvest it. So for a beaver and such designated as a fur animal, you can use a trapping license or you can actively go out and hunt the animal themselves. Same thing goes for foxes and wolves. So there's a distinction between the methodology of how the artist wants to go out and collect the materials. Some animals are, can only be done with trapping. Some, if they're listed as a fur animal, allows for more diversity of harvest materials. Another thing that's important that they really need to focus on is the fur deer dealer license. So now the fur dealer license allows an artist to buy, barter, or resell animal skins, so raw animal skins, rather than for personal use or sale for the fur artist to individually trap. So if you're going to be buying and purchasing raw animal hides and then utilizing it to sell for another thing, you're going to be needing a fur dealer license itself. But if you're personally going out and harvesting the materials, transforming it into native art, and it's for personal use or turning it into native art, you don't need that fur dealer license. But if you're going out and buying raw hide, you're gonna need that fur dealer license. I talked a little bit about big game trophies. When you're looking at utilizing native art materials from these big game animals, it's really important to note that you cannot sell, barter, or even advertise for sale the big game trophy, including any part of a big game animal. The key here is it prohibits the artwork utilizing big game that are a lifelike representation made from any part of the big game animal. So one example of that is looking at these old uh, dance accessories representing brown bear claws. So the claws themselves are still attached to the hide, to the paw. In that case, it is actually still considered a lifelike representation, even though you do have shells that are actually embedded in the claws it's considered a lifelike representation and thus a trophy and cannot be sold commercially. On the flip side, we have this beautiful mask that is actually made by the artist Scott Jennison. Now it has beautiful uh, mountain goat wool along the edges here, but it's not a trophy because you can see the horns themselves, the goat are actually carved. They're not actual mountain goat, antler, uh, mountain goat horns. So in that case, it's not considered a trophy 
but it is very similar to a lifelike representation, but it's not utilizing the natural materials in that aspect to do that lifelike representation. So in this case, it's not a trophy, it is actually a native art form. So it's very distinct on what you utilize the materials for and how they actually have that lifelike representation. Now this goes even further when you start talking about antlers and horns themselves. There's a lot of uh, regulations concerning the antlers and the horns as trophies. So in general, artists can't buy, sell, or barter horns if they're attached to the skull. You may possess horns or antlers if they were given to you by somebody who salvaged them or removed the meat from the field and you've already eaten the meat of the animal that you killed themselves. So you can have it for personal use, but you can't barter or sell anything if the antlers are still attached to the skull because that is considered a trophy. So horns and antlers, of course, are traditional native art materials, and they need to make sure they provide for the allowance of making traditional art materials and art forms. So if the antlers are naturally shed and they still have the actual base of the antler called the pedicel at the attach, they can be sold. And they can be sold raw as found in the field. And those are the ones that naturally fall. If the antlers are removed from the skull and then transformed into a handicraft, they may be sold. Artists may remove caribou antlers from the skull for personal use, but they cannot sell until they've been transformed into a handicraft. So it's hard to be able to sell those natural antlers unless they've already been transformed into a handicraft itself. So example of that, you can see right here is a beautiful piece of ivory that was actually carved. And you can see a little bit of the nicely carved caribou antler. So this has been significantly modified into a handicraft itself. It's only a piece of the antler. It's not, it is a lifelike representation, but the entire piece is not becoming the lifelike representation. It's only a section to be a lifelike. In comparison to the bottom piece right here, this is one of my pieces called a lifelike representation. And this one actually is unique because when you're looking at it, you can see that the velvet antlers is still attached onto a wood base. It's beautifully carved and it is a lifelike representation, but the way it made a lifelike representation is utilizing the raw caribou antler itself. And there is a section of the skull still attached to the antler and thus it cannot be sold commercially. However, it can be used for personal use. There are several artists that actually be able to like to go through and find these antlers after they harvest the animal and they will be able to utilize it for personal use art. However, it cannot be commercially sold because it's still considered a trophy because the raw materials are considered what is giving that lifelike representation. So we talked a little bit about the Migratory Bird Treaty Act a bit prior to that. It's always important to make the distinction between the non-migratory birds so we do have what are called upland game bird species in the state of Alaska. And these are specifically under the management of the state of Alaska. Alaska manages uh, mostly grouse species and ptarmigan species as small game. And because they're not migratory, their non-edible byproducts can be utilized for commercial native art like domestic bird varieties such as turkeys and chickens. So if you're looking at trying to actually go through and do dance fans and you want to avoid a lot of the regulations associated with migratory birds, or you're not a rural resident and such and you want to make traditional dance fans, you can utilize ptarmigan and grouse and turkey and other chicken feathers and slightly modify that to be able to mimic a lot of the natural other wild species that you would prefer to use. And what's unique about it is when you're using it for commercial art, those ones really do require again that form, but then you can designate them as grouse and ptarmigan. So then they are non-migratory that allows you to be able to actually go through and validate that that handicraft made has species that are considered upland game bird species. If you have any questions specifically about use of feathers, again, I always recommend talking to a US Fish and Wildlife Service inspector and they're the ones that actually are the ones who are going to be signing off on that form and helping you actually declare different species utilized in those art forms. And they're always available for questions. So we talked a lot about game species. There's a lot of management also on botanical materials. 
So when you're talking about native arts, we do utilize a lot of materials such as roots, bark, and even looking at lashings itself. So these are gonna be derived from non-timber biological resources. They can be utilized for both personal, educational, commercial, or scientific uses. So when we start talking about biological native art materials or botanical native art materials, we're gonna be talking specifically about bark, fern, moss, burls, berries, cones, conchs, herbs, roots, diamond willow, even wildflowers. So it's a wealth of different materials, but they are very distinct when we start talking about state and federal management. Now the state of Alaska manages them as non-timber forest products. And they're managed primarily by the Alaska Department of DNR, Division of Mining and Land. They issue what is called the Alaska Non-Timber Forest Products Harvest Manual. That manual is very important because it actually establishes the harvesting quotas, the seasons, everything you really need to look at when you're doing commercial native arts, utilizing those botanical resources. It's very similar to the federal government. However, they, instead of calling them non-timber forest products, they call them special forest products. They're pretty much the same thing. It's just different terminology, whether or not you're talking to a state, a state agency or federal agency. So special forest products. So you have the National Forest Agency and then also the Park Agency. They have individual management regarding those special forest products. So depending on where you're going and depending on what forest and such, they will have different management policies on the harvest and utilization. So in general, the management under the special forest product resource manual policy. So that's kind of an overarching management plan and policy for most of the US Forest Service and most of the forest lands. But again, each forest, so like the Tongass National Forest or the Chugach will have very detailed plans about utilization of special forest products. It's always good to talk to the land manager itself before you're looking at going into the area for harvesting of these materials for the development of commercial native arts. So talking a little more in detail with the state of Alaska, the state of Alaska does issue that non-timber forest product harvest manual. That provides a lot of the information that every Alaska native artist needs to know in regards to actually the quantity limits, the harvest seasons, and even the protocol about how you go about harvesting it. Example of this is just for Diamond Willow for state lands. They have a quantity limit of about a maximum of 100 stems that are 2.5 inches thick and 25 stems of four inches or greater and then 10 stems of six inch and greater, and then five stems greater than six inch. No more than 50% of the diamond marked stems can be actually harvested in any given area, and any stems less than two inches diameter may not be cut. So that's how specific some of these things can be. And some of the manuals actually do take into a consideration traditional harvest materials and styles of the cultures from that actually you derive a lot of these materials. A good example of that is when we're talking about cedar bark. They have an annual quantity limit of 100 strips annually of one fourth circumference of the tree. Now, again, when you're looking at a strip of cedar bark you're removing, traditionally when you're looking at those cultures, they would request that individuals only take one strip per tree. And that was actually incorporated into the harvest manual. In addition, they also request that the harvest protocols for that area is only 10% of the standing trees in the given area. It's one strip per tree and the present preference for dead trees in that particular area. So in this case, they're really looking at working with a lot of the natives in the community and actually utilizing some of the traditional harvest styles and methodologies. But they're also, again, trying to do preservation on sustainable yield policy. That's what most of these examples of the harvest manual are trying to be able to sustain is get that sustainable yield principle. So when do you need a state permit? When do you need to start talking to DNR with the state of Alaska and trying to get that commercial permit? And generally, you can't really collect them from for commercial and state parks. Again, state parks have different regulations as compared to the commercial, but collection of non-timber forest products for commercial usually and almost always requires a permit, even products for process to make native arts themselves. So you're not necessarily selling the individual materials, 
you're actually making it into commercial art, you will probably need a permit. Now, in contrast, uh, gathering a special forest products for personal use may require a permit. It really depends on the quantity that you're looking at. So small amounts that are used for personal use don't really need much for permitting. But if you're going to be harvesting a huge amount from an area, it's very important to start talking to the land manager and they will probably be able to assist you in whether or not you will be needing a permit because of the amount of quantity that you're going to be harvesting. So in general, talk to DNR with the state of Alaska if you're looking at actually doing commercial art and harvesting the materials from a certain area or even being able to do it for personal use. Some of the baskets, if you're looking at using in a lot of grass for a particular area, such as Yupik quail baskets, utilize a lot of traditional rye grass. So talking to land managers, if you're looking at trying to do a very large basket and seeing if you need to do a permit for particularly for that area, especially if you're looking at doing multiple baskets for personal use. So special forest product management policy. So this is talking about whether or not you're gonna be needing federal permits. So the policy defines and distinguishes between non-commercial and commercial use. And that's the main takeaway when you start talking a little bit with federal permits. However, each national forest park and wilderness area has its own programs, policies, and harvesting restrictions. So it's very important if you're going to be going into a particular forest, such as the Tongass National Forest, to start looking at the Tongass National Forest harvest policy for these special forest products. So where resources are limited, personal use has a lower priority than subsistence, but higher than other uses. So there is a priority ranking in some of these areas. So in Southeast Alaska, there is a preference for rural subsistence. Then you have personal use, and then there could be commercial use. But again, there is that priority ranking of providing for subsistence use first for rural community residents. And Another aspect that's interesting is, again, they can provide very details on where you're able to harvest and different restrictions. Example of this is the Tongass National Forest, where it prohibits soil distribution and disturbance for harvesting of roots or shrubbery stems within a 33-foot buffer from any stream banks. So as an artist myself, I know that looking at sandy soils along stream banks, the roots there usually tend to grow straight. So those are usually some of the preferred areas but they do have a prohibit of doing so because you need to make sure there's not going to be any disruption of riverbanks and such, especially looking at salmon. So they're trying to do again that conservation and preservation of the ecosystem in that area and making sure there isn't going to be undue disturbance in that region. So they're very particular in certain regions where you can actually go out and harvest and trying to, pre trying to prevent a lot of degradation of the landscape. So commercial red and yellow cedar bark harvest are mostly limited to trees designated for timber harvest. And again, you can find out those different areas specifically depending on where we're gonna be set up for harvest. And they do allow for timber harvest in certain areas. So an artist can go out there ahead of time and be able to actually harvest a lot of the cedar bark from those regions. Um, commercial harvest at Devil Club is generally prohibited throughout the Tongass National Forest as compared to other areas. So it's important, again, to start looking at individual national forests before you go out and start harvesting natural botanical resources. And they'll have very specific requirements or even uh, prohibitions and such. So when do you need a federal permit? So gathering a special forest products for commercial uses, very similar to the state, generally needs a permit, even products that are processed for sale. That's very similar to the state, same is true for the feds. Key here is gathering a special forest products for personal use may require a permit as well. Again, they do provide exceptions for individuals that are harvesting a little bit for personal use. So if you're looking at trying just to learn how to weave or trying to get a little bit of cedar bark, you generally don't need a permit, but if you're looking at getting larger quantities and such, or like having a full on workshop or such, that starts getting into the realm of where you may need a permit. Again, it's better to talk to the land manager themselves, specifically to that designated forest area. Now, here's an interesting thing. Tribal governments can apply for commercial special forest 
resource harvest permits. So then you can get batch harvest permits that are actually given to tribal governments. So this blanket permit is subject again to Forest Service regulations, but you have artists that actually go through their tribe and they're considered sub permittees to harvest under the permit. So it does actually save a lot of the red tape and regulatory forms if you just talk to your local tribe and see if they actually already have a permit with the Forest Service to allow them to actually be able to give out sub permits for their own artists to be able to go out and harvest. And this is actually a very wonderful tool for a lot of the artists and such to be able to be provided by their tribe a large permit to allow their artists to be able to create and be able to get those natural resources for the continuation of traditional art forms. So this is just one example where you don't necessarily have to be the individual permittee going through all the regulations. Sometimes you can work with your tribe and just be a sub permittee. So that was a very, very brief discussion of regulatory theory for native arts. When in doubt, talk to the individual land manager. And it's very important that everybody takes the time to actually look through the regulations, look at what you're trying to harvest, the materials that you're trying to harvest, the seasonality, but then also talk to the land manager. That is both for personal use, but then also for commercial use itself. As with all of my presentations, I wanna take the time to actually thank all the Native elders that actually have shared their skills, knowledge, and humor with me for actually being able to become a Native artist myself and teaching the future generations. And uh, next week, we're gonna be talking more details about significant modification and intent.